Hello, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Um, my name is Jen. I am a library aide here at Syosset Public Library, and I have a fabulous co-host today. Would you like to introduce yourself? Yes. Hi, I'm Kay. I'm one of the Reader's Services Librarians at the Syosset Public Library, so you all can come to me when you need a new book to read. <laughs> and you should. She's very, very good at what she does. <laughs> the most enticing possible introduction. It's like, <laughs> like what could be better than someone who could recommend me every book? Yep. <laughs> Uh, so thank you so much for joining us. We're here with a really fabulous writer today. But before we start to talk about our guest and the book that they've brought, um, I just like to lay down a few ground rules. Um, so this is a safe space. Um, we will not tolerate any homophobia, racism, sexism, misogyny, transphobia, none of that. Uh, this is a safe space and we like to maintain it that way. Thank you very much for cooperating. Um, you will be able to submit questions via the chat. Uh, that way we can all see them and we'll answer them uh, as we go. Uh, Kay and I will also be here to moderate if necessary. So please send us any and all questions you have. Um, and with that, I will turn it over to our special guest. Could I ask you to introduce yourself and the book that you're here with today? Sure. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, I'm Lana Harper. I'm the author of the Witches of Thistle Grove series, uh, which started with Payback's a Witch um, in, I guess, 2021. It feels like longer ago than that, but it hasn't been that long. Um, the most recent book is Back in a Spell. So that is the one that we're talking about tonight. Um, this one was an interesting one um, for me to write because the Thistle Grove universe is uh, mostly composed of four witch families, um, the magical town that they live in. And this one is the only one so far narrated by uh, a Blackmore family member. They're sort of the villainous, entitled, wealthiest, most powerful family. And so um, the story is about Nina Blackmore, who is kind of by their standards, like a pretty grounded common sense witch. She's been um, like a year ago, dumped by her fiance almost at the altar and has been having a very difficult time adjusting and kind of finding her way forward. So she becomes entangled with um, Morty Gutierrez, who is the owner of the Shamrock Cauldron, um, one of the quirky bars in town. Uh, Morty has a bone to pick with the Blackmore family um, because they've been trying very, very aggressively to buy out their family's bar out from under them. So the two of them end up on this very awkward uh, uh, dating app date that doesn't go very well. Um, but then things become extremely complicated because it turns out that Nina's magic is just surging for incomprehensible reasons, sort of a mystery. Why is that happening? And Morty is also developing special powers, which doesn't normally happen unless someone becomes a family member, one of the witch families, um, as a partner, like a form of kind of like a witch marriage. So it's a little bit of like a self-discovery journey for Nina. A lot of generational and parental trauma for her to unpack and then of course their relationship developing this mystery that's happening with uh with them in the town so it was a very therapeutic um and I think softer book for me to write than some of the other books in the series um and I am happy to talk about any part of it I've also brought my own booze as directed <laughs> so cheers thank you for having me and thank you for letting me have some white wine <laughs> while we talk about witches it makes me very happy I feel like uh you know it's it's part of the the witchy misdeed so we need to you know we need to let that happen <laughs> absolutely <laughs> I should have I actually have a uh, these glasses that I bought at a Ren fair um and they're a matching set so they have um these little dragon tails that make a heart or they go against each other if you set them in a different way they're my goblets and I should really have used one like this was such a missed opportunity so I apologize for not <laughs> representing properly <laughs> I'll have to see those, those are super I will I'll have to bring them <laughs> I have seen those at my own Ren fair when I've gone a few times and I'm always like today's the day no not today <laughs> they're so, beautiful they're, they're a little, beautiful they're, they're more expensive than they should be truly but they're very sturdy like they've seen me through three different moves and neither of them has shown like any signs of even like contemplating cracking so I feel like they were a good investment for myself you said you said the main thesis of renaissance fairs a little too expensive for what they yeah. are <laughs> <laughs> that is I mean, really that what they should be called exactly this was too why did I buy it I just had to 
<laughs> that is absolutely true of Renaissance fairs, actually. Yeah. Like, I used to go every year, and now we're like, mm, for a while, we're like, every other year. Mm -hmm. three years every four you know <laughs> like <laughs> I did the same thing it was a King's Richard Fair in Carvershire it was in Massachusetts and I loved it so much or maybe Connecticut I forget a little bit of a drive and we went every year and then suddenly just started tapering off and obviously I, I haven't found my Renaissance Fair in Illinois but that's probably it's it's coming for me <laughs> this will spark it Tomorrow you'll get an email <laughs> that exact, or I'll have to like go down the rabbit hole of like, what's the best one close to me? Cause I have to find the biggest one. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I have a question if we'd like to get into the books, um, given that this is an installment in a series, I'm wondering like when you are crafting something that, um, you know, a particular challenge I've always sort of like thought about when it comes to series is that each installment has to has its own have its own arc but then there also has to be sort of an overarching arc <laughs> to say arc a lot <laughs> and, um, you know, how do you balance like the needs of a particular story and the needs of like an ongoing story especially like maybe if you don't know how many installments there are going to be you know mm -hmm. that's it's a very good question and one that I've sort of had to um answer for myself writing these books I've never been lucky enough before to have so much space to play with um this is the longest running series that I've ever written all my other books are duologies and so it's just been really such a boon because the world has started to feel so familiar to me but then there's always different layers and so I like to I like to think of each each book as a standalone so they are companion novels technically they do happen in chronological order but I'm trying to write each of them um, in a way that would allow new readers to start pretty much wherever they'd like. So I, I try to avoid spoilers as much as I possibly can. Obviously, some things you just can't because it's so crucial to the development of the world. But I, I tend to think of the narrative arc of that book as more important than the larger arc. And then the larger arc tends to be sort of macro stuff that has to do with the lore of the town um, and the backstory of the families. So sort of no matter where you kind of dive in, um, I don't think it's going to ruin the other books for you if you haven't started at an earlier one. But I find I think the the easiest way to do it, or at least the way that works for me, is to think this is the story that I'm telling. It's like the largest part of this very wide tapestry that hopefully I like know how to weave because <laughs> some of it is definitely um, spontaneous and I don't have everything planned out very, very in great detail. Like I do plot things out and I had a a pretty like a, a a solid sense of the largest the larger arc but there's always room for kind of organic development and things change and things have shifted so I tend to focus on um, the emotional relationship and the emotional journey of the main character in the romance and then with each book the fantastical elements have gotten a little more complicated because mm -hmm. I just can't help myself like it's what I really love to do so it's it is it's, each story is the focus, but Thistle Grove is um, a common character, right? And since that's kind of the overarching, the overarching arc <laughs> is Thistle Grove. It's easy. It's easier to think about it in the sense of like the well, the environment is part of the story that I'm telling. What can I do to enhance and also allow a new reader um, into this world without overwhelming them? Mm. That's very interesting. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, we do have a question from the audience. Yeah. Can you tell us a bit about the families in the series? The Blackmore family has been sort of shifty in the last few books. <laughs> <laughs> they have. They are shifty. They are generally very shifty people. Uh, so there are four families. Um, the Thistle Grove, the town of Thistle Grove was founded by um, the Avramovs, the Blackmores, the Harlows, and the Thorns. Um, the Harlows are at kind of on, on surface level. They're like the magical record keepers and librarians. They have the most subdued powers. They are technically um, not as strong and influential as the other families. Uh, their family lore gets developed much more as the books go on. And we discover all kinds of hidden things and sort of their connection with the town that was previously not obvious. Um, the Blackmores are the elementalists. They are the heavyweights. They're the strongest of the witches. Um, I, I thought it would be fun to link each family or most of the families to um, like a, a witch figure or like a magical figure that's common in lore. And so they're allegedly descended from Morgan Le Fay. And so all of them have these like ridiculous Arthurian names. So Nina is actually Nynaeve and her brother is Gareth and their little brother is Gawain. And so everyone has those names. Um, the Avermaugh family are, um, they're practitioners of death magic. 
very heavy Slavic influences there because I love to talk about all of that. I love Slavic magic. I love Slavic folklore. I've been waiting all my life to write books about, you know, those kinds of families and that kind of magic because that's where I'm from. And so they're descended from Baba Yaga, but they're like counterintuitively super hot. So they're like the goth, the goth family of sexy necromancers, gorgeous, but also kind of morally ambiguous, um, not shifty in the way the Black Moors are. The Black Moors are more, they just like to throw their weight around. Um, they've amassed a lot of money. They want a lot of the gauntlets. And so they have like a disproportionate share of power in the town. The thorns are, the thorns are just lovely. Like uh, I don't personally identify with them because I'm like, hi, you are too pure for this world. And for me, <laughs> I don't know how you exist this way. So they're uh, nature, green magic, healing, um, their domain is the honey cake orchards. That's another thing that I, I should have mentioned. Each family has um, their sort of magical skill set and then also their family domain. Um, the Harlows have Harlow House, which is just a house. Like it's really just like a handsome colonial house, not much else. And then they have Tomes and Omens, which is a, an occult bookstore on the main street. Um, the Avramovs live in the Bitters, which is this very haunted Victorian mansion that abuts the Witch Woods, which is also a very haunted forest. Um, and they own the Arcane Emporium, which is a Yuichi Walmart. It's like a massive occult megastore. And I was thinking of um, all of the very cool occult stores in Salem that I used to visit back when I lived very close to there. They have a, a haunted house immersive experience that also is like one of my favorite things to do. So a lot of this is wish fulfillment, like my favorite places and activities that I like. Um, the Blackmores live on an estate called Tintagel, which is one of the Arthurian. Yeah. And then they own Castle Camelot, which is like a sort of like a supersized Disney take of a Renaissance fair in medieval times. <laughs> so they have this like cheesy castle where they're jousting and wenches and turkey legs and it's like really fun and I would like to go there um and the thorns have the honey cake orchards so they have um an apple orchard they have like a magical heart tree that is the center of everything and honey cake cottage is their technical family domain where the family the, the elders of the family live so did I miss a family in describing all of them I don't think so that's all four right and their family domains and talents yeah that was very comprehensive. Thank you. It was. I'm sorry. I was like, wow, I've been talking a lot Excellent. about this. It's, I really love It's like my favorite part of things because I got to cobble together this town that is like where I would really like to live. Um, and I thought a lot about like what food would I eat there? Which restaurants would I go to first? Like someone once asked me, what was my Thistle Grove itinerary? And I was like, I've been waiting for this question because <laughs> I know what it is. <laughs> it's like um I will let Kay ask a question soon. I don't mean to dominate this. I'm so sorry. It's okay. But, um, you know, like that really is a testament, I think, to like the world building, you know, like that you can imagine spending like all this time in this world. And like, like, how did you approach this? Like, did you sort of like imagine the world first and then populate it with people or did like the mm -hmm. families and their characteristics drive how the, the world developed, I guess? <laughs> This is a good, it's like the chicken and the egg question on Thistle Grove. It's an, there's an interesting answer there. And it's not, not one that people expect because it sounds sort of mercenary, um, but it wasn't really at the time. So back when I started writing um, Payback, I was planning on making the jump from YA, which all my previous books were young adults. And I was writing, I had an adult thriller that I wanted to shop. And then my agent, who is a genius, she's wonderful. I've known each other, we've known each other for a long time, we went to school together. Um, she had been doing editor meetings. And so she came to me with the idea of like, why don't you maybe write a witchy rom-com? Because I keep hearing from editors that that's what they want. Like, and this happens. I remember back when I was an agent, like something would get in the water and suddenly all the editors would out of the zeitgeist decide like, this is what we want. We've all been infected with the desire for a witchy rom-com. And so she was like, you love witches. That's your brand. Everything you write is witches always. You've wanted to do a rom-com why don't we do this? And so we threw kind of just ideas back and forth. And she was the one who was like, what if you did John Tucker must die, but everyone is witches and two of the women fall in love. And that was it. It was one sentence. And I was like, oh, yes, that's it. And so I went from that sentence to, okay, why? Who is this guy? Why is he such a douchebag? What did he do? What are the stakes? There have to be at least three women involved in this plot plus this guy. So like, what is, what do the magical families look like? 
So I started with the idea of a magical town and then I wanted to know, okay, who are the families? So I guess the families came before I started nailing down what does the town look like? And then when I when I had kind of the details of their family histories, who, who were their ancestors? How did all that look like? I started thinking about what would the ideal witchy touristy town be like? And I have the benefit of having lived near Salem, which is like the pinnacle of that. Like it's campy, it's cheesy, but it's also, it has this ambiance that in, in some ways is very authentic. Like you really feel something special being there in fall and during Samhain and all of that. And I loved being there. And so I was thinking, what are my favorite parts? How can I make them into kind of a larger than life? Um, in some ways, not to say like the Disney version of that, because that's not what I was going for. I was going for the funnest, sparkliest, most interesting depiction of these things that I already enjoyed. So I was like, I love immersive theater, like sleep no more, stick that in a haunted house. I love India cult bookstores, make one of the families have those, like love apple orchards, make one with an enchanted hedge maze where the flowers sing. Like that's really what it was. I wanted it to have this Tim Burton, but brighter kind of like phantasmagoric, like maybe you're like on a little bit of like microdosing something while you're there, sort of aesthetic. Not that I, full disclosure, I have never microdosed. I would never, I'm very scared of, of many drugs, but I imagine this is what it would be like if you lived in Thistle Grove. Like there's like singing flowers and the coolest food and everything's delicious and smells like fall and magic. And I thought about it as like, what if you could live in a Yankee candle, like a fall scented Yankee candle? And that's, even though they're not, I guess the best example, like there are better smelling candles out there, but that's what I was thinking of at the time. So I guess families first, then the town. And then with every book, because obviously I have like a food fixation. I had to know where are these characters eating? What are they eating? What are the names of these places? And so it started kind of building out the main street and all the various other kind of venues of interest. So I really, I just love thinking about stuff like that. I want to, not that I want to like harp on the families, but I want to like <laughs> keep kind of talking about them a little bit. Cause I did wonder, and you answered it a little bit that like one of the families was based off of the Lafays. Mm -hmm. um, where did you get the names for the other families who were like, you know, mm -hmm. what, what made you think of these names and these people? The specific yeah. names, I couldn't tell you, like, I don't remember the Avramovs I was thinking of. So I wanted a Slavic name, but not like, um, one that decided I mean they are they eventually became Russian like that was part of their story but all of these names are sort of names that occurred to me I wanted them to like this is vaguely you know I want them to be Welsh kind of Celtic this one family um the Blackmores had the Arthurian connection but I don't recall how I don't I didn't have a specific process some of that initial drafting really felt weirdly like discovery writing like it was easy. It was, it really just was, I was telling my agent about this. It was like, ar almost like archaeology. Like I was finding things that already existed and I had never felt that way writing a book before. And it made it feel really fun and kind of exhilarating in a way that I, that I'd never experienced because all of that heavy lifting of initial world building, I didn't feel it while I was doing this. So I don't recall really like where did the name Harlow? I think I just like the name Harlow. <laughs> like, And then for the thorns, you know, it had to be um like flora and fauna related mostly flora so that was obvious for the Avramovs, i was like i need a sexy what is a sexy necromancer what is their last name like it has to be kind of russian sounding but hot like what is it gonna be and that's pretty much how that happened so i don't know if that's a good answer i don't think so i think it's a great answer <laughs> i was just like what are hot names for families yeah that's like sound is important I feel like you know and as, as well as the imagery that they they invoke and that's like hard to kind of like uh put into words <laughs> sometimes you know yeah my names resonate um can you talk a little bit about the relationship at the core of this book because the dynamic is really interesting and very unique I think in a lot of ways yeah. um so yeah can you talk about like um I'm also interested in like you know when people are crafting romances like what comes first like the characters or like the vibe of the dynamic you know if that makes sense it does um in this case I knew so Morty's been around since the first book um and I knew that I wanted them to be in a relationship ideally with a witch because I I hadn't explored the idea of a, a normie or a mundane with a witch and all of them I thought what would be interesting were all the moral implications that came with that because it's so easy sort of to have this town full of witches who are kind of running amok and having um, sometimes curses, sometimes 
beautiful things happening, but they're glamoring all of these residents who like have no say in the fact that they don't remember the magic that they see. And so this is a moment for one of the, a member of one of the more entitled families of witches to have to face the fact that like, maybe this isn't entirely cool. <laughs> like Maybe there's a better way you know, for us to live side by side with the regular, you know, denizens of the town. And then their specific dynamic was interesting to me because part of Nina's identity is so entangled with this overbearing, domineering, very toxic family. So she is the product of like a narcissistic mother, a narcissistic grandmother, and she has all of these accompanying behaviors and defense mechanisms and just a lot of pain and trauma that cause her to behave in a very rule-oriented, restrictive way because she feels like she has to be this highly self-protective overachiever who happens to be especially vulnerable right now because of what happened with her fiance a year ago. And then Morty has this extremely healthy family relationship, wonderfully supportive family for the most part. Um, and then an interesting sort of spontaneous personality compared to Nina who has to like white knuckle everything and has been made to feel by her previous partner that there's something very wrong with wanting to control aspects of your life. And so it was a balance of being like some of these behaviors on her end are maybe pathological, but maybe they're not. Maybe that's just who she is and there's nothing wrong with protecting yourself and having rules. That doesn't mean you're not a fun person. Like those things can also be, um, behaviors that are respected and valued by your partner as long as you disentangle them from you know whatever toxic origin they came from and so the two of them together Morty almost presents like the moral center of the story in terms of making Nina see here are the problems with the way that you witches run things here are your specific problems <laughs> with the family and then without too many spoilers what's going on with Nina her personal arc is this tremendous ascension in power. And she has kind of two ways that she conceivably deal with it. One of them is the very Blackmore way. And um, my editor called it Nina's possible uh, villain origin story. So if she had decided to go a different route. That's what would have happened. She could have become this super powered villain. The Blackmores would certainly have been the dominant family forever. But because of Morty, Morty's gaze on her, they're very... Um, balanced and healthy dynamic she starts looking at things in a way that she's been afraid to or maybe not capable of previously so I really needed Morty to sort of be um an example of you know who can you be if you're really if you're allowed to live as as you are and who you're meant to be instead of constantly being penned in by other people's expectations the weight of your family the burdens that they put on you um so I Really, I also really enjoyed um, They're the Only Witchbound Couple in the series. And I was thinking, how fun would it be if you had this connection with another person where you could feel their feelings and you could feel their physical sensations? Like, that would really give you, without telepathy, because I don't think anyone wants that. Like, I don't think anyone really wants to know what everyone's thinking at all times. But having the read of someone's emotional landscape and understanding is such a high level of empathy. Like, most of us can't, can't quite get there by which is normal of course like it's difficult to completely grasp someone or else's emotional experience and then I also thought for you know like the sexy scenes how interesting would that be where you had this like insight into somebody else's experience that way so the two of them are really bound up on so many levels and they have to make so many decisions jointly and responsibly um that I think in that way they probably have more weight on them than the previous couples mm. You're absolutely right that telepathy would be awful because you know it would. most of the time yeah. I don't even want to know what all of my thoughts are. <laughs> <laughs> like I wish I wasn't even having these. Yes, but sharing them with people. Yeah. Like yeah, ninety percent of them aren't true. You know, so yeah, like, exactly. We can like vet them before we <laughs> put them out in the world. Um, I that was really really interesting, and you know something that I've. I am by no means an expert on romance. I think Kay probably knows a lot more about romance than I do. So only about reading it, not experiencing <laughs> it. Oh, that's absolutely. <laughs> that's right. I've read like 20 rom-coms this year so far. And we wow. are in April. I, awesome. I have a problem. I can't. I don't know. I think you now. have a solution. That doesn't <laughs> yeah, sound like a problem. Yeah, actually, on that note, can I ask a quick question? Okay. I have a good one. I really like certain tropes. And I've noticed like, mm -hmm. you know, you've done a book about yeah. uh, enemies to lovers and you did like mm -hmm. a sunshiny one and a storm cloudy one. Mm -hmm. uh, what kind of tropes do you 
love? Like, are you looking to write, you know, anything specific, anything next? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, uh, so I really enjoy tropes, obviously. I think they're really fun. And each of the books does have a trope. Um, I was thinking of this one as awkward first date, not necessarily um, enemies. So enemies to lovers, I was thinking of from bad to curse with my enemies to lovers. Um, and then um, one that I've never done before and that I'm writing now is second chance romance. So that's interesting. Um, and to anyone who's, it's not the one that people think it's going to be. There's like a strong content. And I, I don't know how much about, because we haven't announced the next book, but then the the arcs of, um, or, or rather the book after the next book are available. So I feel okay in saying that this is going to be, the fifth book will be another sapphic couple. So this is to people who are like, it's sort of the two camps who are like, Gareth had better never have another chance with Lyndon or like, when is Gareth's redemption arc coming? And I'm like, alas, it is not. <laughs> so, <laughs> at least not soon, anytime soon. I'm not, I have not envisioned that one, but I'm really excited doing this one because second chance romance is tricky in that you have to somehow evoke whatever happened before without giving too much backstory and overloading things. Um, and it's one that I personally have a hard time connecting with in other books. And so this is an experiment for me to see like, how does it work if I'm, if I'm working with, like my favorite trope is enemies to lovers. And I also love awkward first dates. Um, whereas second chance romance, I'm like, no, I'm always a little on the fence with that one. So it is definitely, it's been a learning experience, but really fun so far. I'm also a huge fan of enemy lovers and for some reason so fake good. dating even though like I love fake dating <laughs> yeah, in reality I'm like it would never happen it would never work but like yeah, it doesn't books... matter yeah, uh, yeah. Do you know my favorite recent one so well, I, I think I don't know if it's out yet it's TJ Alexander's um chef's choice I think not mm -hmm. chef's kiss I think TJ Alexander's first one was chef's kiss and then this is chef's choice um and it's a fake dating premise um it's it's gorgeous it's just fantastic like everything about it is is so far fetched and yet it's like one of the best books i've ever read and i love it so much so i was really into alexis hall's boyfriend material that's fake dating oh, i haven't read that one okay all Highly right maybe I'll, it. I'll do that one next you're all talking right, to the you. right person remember yeah <laughs> exactly <laughs> especially for rom com yeah I, I like to think of tropes as almost like uh uh like poetic forms, you know? It's like you could write like a free verse uh poem mm -hmm. or you could write like a sonnet and you can see what you can do within like a set of limits, you know? And I I think that's really cool that like you can by picking something like that, you can actually like expand the way that people mm -hmm. think of the trope and you know, like do fun things with it. Mm, yeah. yeah that's beautiful. I haven't thought of it that way, but I think that's the perfect I think sometimes people get carried away a little bit in terms of tropes when they're talking about rom-coms like oh these books are identical look it's the same trope and the same and it's like well a trope isn't actually a plot or the content <laughs> like it's just a very basic device like it's a framework yes we all share a lot of frameworks it's true like it's an occupational hazard or not even a hazard like it's like a a lovely tool that you have that you get to use so I really like the idea of thinking of it as a poetic form or device like that thanks um oh gosh I had a question from before oh right okay so romance something that I've been noticing and I would love to see if Kay backs me up on this observation because I haven't shared it yet but like I feel like romance lately has become like a little bit more like interior and that relates to I think about like what you were saying about like exploring like per parental dynamics and stuff and how mm -hmm. that affects relationships you know and I'm wondering if that is something that you kind of thought about because like you know none of us go in in our own romances like none of us are you know going into them as like tabula rasas who have never mm -hmm. experienced relationships we've been like conditioned by all of these like other mm -hmm. relationships that exist and mm -hmm. so is that something that you kind of like thought about in bringing in like you know the uh like the family dynamics and, and how it shapes how they interact mm -hmm. I mean I I was thinking of all of these characters as uh, you know people who are at different points in their lives and they happen to be witches but they also happen to just be people and they're usually at a specific point in a self-discovery journey of some kind. And so it's not as though, you know, the romance is an element of something that's helping them get to where they need to be, but they are, they're people in their own right. And then the, whatever the emotional arc is, is something that's been created by who they were in the past. And it, it there's, that's the way the real world operates. And I think it would be it's unrealistic to sort of consider characters, which is why I don't love like love at first sight sort of stories or, 
the notion of um I don't like um possessive jealousy and romance that has to do with like we're gonna ignore everyone who came before like you are driven snow and mine now like no everyone has real histories and people are often friends with their exes even so in the next book one of the things that I did and I really like intentionally did it was I had um it's Delilah Harlow is the main character and her best friend is Ivy Thorne who was her former partner of two years so they were partnered and then they broke up. And instead of being like, oh, well, you're gone now, you've disappeared, which you can't really do in a small town anyway, especially if you're witches and there's only so many of you, um, they're best friends. Like they decided, they decided to stay friends and their relationship evolved into something else. And so the idea of people coming into your life and then taking on different roles, I think is realistic. And I think more realistic than than looking at it from other from kind of that exclusionary standpoint of we're all like islands and we're not molded by other people. So I, I like that, that narrative and that perspective in romance. Hmm. Yeah. Kind of like let's relationships be like messy, which even like mm-hmm. even, even yeah. relationships are kind of messy sometimes, you know? Like- yes, exactly. <laughs> mm-hmm. All right. Do we have any more questions from the audience or Kay, do you have any more questions? Okay. I had some more if you want to talk a little more about the world and world building. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you Um, do yours again. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) Um, I would love to know about like, you know, sort of like the word I'm looking for. It's not like brands, but like the the kind of flavors of magic that the the different families uh, practice. And like, uh, like, did you consult any like, uh, real magical sources or any mm-hmm. like uh, texts that exist like in our world yeah. in order to like craft the magic systems in in your world. Mm-hmm. Um, I love talking about this. Uh, so one of the reasons I write about witches all the time is because they're my favorite subject. <laughs> they're my favorite topic. I've always been really interested. I might have to take a quick break to pull down the shades because the sunset is hitting me right in the eyeballs. And yeah, I can't see right. you. Yeah. <laughs> one second. <laughs> I was wondering that why the light suddenly dramatically changed. Yeah. Like, oh, she's had a great idea. Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm sure you both were like, why is your <laughs> light doing here? Do you have a weird like a poltergeist messing with your dimmer switches? <laughs> yeah, no, it's there's like a building right across that re- apparently reflects right into my face. I've never had this issue, but it's yeah. So anyway, resolved now. Um, I have always loved witches. I was a member of a Gardnerian coven for a couple of years, and I'm not anymore. But I've always just loved Wicca and neo-paganism in any form. Um, I didn't have like a like a family tradition or anything, but I also like Slavic families tend to do a lot of little folk magic. Like there's lots of little superstitions and rituals and things that get done. And so in thinking, I've read many books about witches, both nonfiction and fiction. Um, I I didn't consult anything in particular while writing these books, mostly because I've been reading and thinking about witches forever. And so what I was mostly thinking about was how do I want to depict magic? Like what kind of magic are we, would be the most compelling here. In previous books, I tended to do what I call like TED Talk magic, where it's like, we understand exactly where the powers come from. The spells are complex. Like there should be footnotes. Like you need like a master's degree to understand exactly why these things function. I'm going to do pages of exposition to tell you exactly what's going on. And not to say that that's not fascinating. I really enjoy books that do that. Um, My favorite, I think is Naomi Novik's books. So she's like, the absolute like master of being able to tell you over the course of 10 pages, like, why does this spell work? How is all of this set up? And there's never a moment of boredom. It's fascinating. It's logical. It's like, oh, this is, of course, that's how magic works. Like you would know. So I wanted this to be a lighter affair than that. And so we're getting a little bit deeper with each book in terms of what is, we know Ladies Lake is the wellspring of magic and all the witches kind of use that as their as their kind of magical fuel. Why is that the case? What's going on with Ladies Lake um, becomes a more uh, kind of a, not a pressing issue, but something that's more of a plot point um, in the books as they go as they go along. 
but mostly I wanted to make the magic accessible. So I wanted each family to be distinct um, and interesting, have its own magical system, its own phrases like uh, the Abram of the Abramov say mother and throne instead of like God or Jesus, you know, when they're using it as in language and then uh, the Blackmores will say triple goddess. So there's just differences in terms of what pantheons they believe in based on their own family history and kind of their individual beliefs. But I, I didn't want any of it to be incredibly require a lot of explanation. Um, I have been <laughs> I have been succumbing to the temptation to get more magic heavy with every installment. And so I think we're getting to a place where it's like, yeah, all right. Like we're going to be explaining the spells a little bit more than we used to, but I still never want that to be the focal point to the, you know, to the degree that a reader is like, Oh, I need to take a break. Cause like, I can't, I can't absorb this much of a magical lesson at once. So I didn't yet. Yeah, that was a very long, of course, um, answer to your question. I didn't look at anything sometimes to remind myself what certain properties of crystals or herbs are. I'll just look things up. I have, I don't know if you can see my witch bookshelf is on one side here. So I have my own books that I use for those kinds of things. So typically if I'm saying that an herb or a crystal does something, it is usually not something I invented. It's something that is used within the Wiccan system or generally like that kind of, that's, it's more, I would say the Gardnerian British inclined system of magic. And then certain things that I remember from my, my grandma using that is obviously more Slavic. So kind of a, kind of a mix there of me having read and then also been a practitioner for a while. Oh, nice. We have some questions coming in from the audience. Yeah, too. Yeah. Veronica asks, uh, are you planning to expand on the influence of the goddess mentioned in Back in a Spell? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely, yes. So there will be much more lake and goddess lore uh, happening in the next two books. Um, I don't want to talk about it anymore it's because I'm so bad at avoiding spoilers. Like I'll spoil my own book so easily. So it will definitely happen. And then I also see someone asked um, about what types of books I like reading. Um, I like, so mostly I would say speculative fiction is my jam, especially anything with any kind of fantastical tinge. So the book that I've been raving about the most this year is Emily Wilde's Encyclopedia of Fairies. Loved it so much. So good. I one thought I was books. the only one. I thought oh, I was the only one. <laughs> I was I was obsessed with that. Like I was neurotically obsessed with it to the point where because I, I talk it like my, my agent is also a friend and I texted her and I was like, I think I'm going to stop writing because I'm never going to write anything like this. And I just don't know if I can just keep going knowing you that know, this book sequel, exists. Right? <laughs> yes, yes. And it's just it's just fantastic. It's like Heather Fawcett has met fairies or done magic and the descriptions of landscapes it's just a delicious book like on every degree like the character building the voice the descriptions like the the way the magic is framed and how compelling and unnerving it is while being so beautiful I love everything about it so that's my current favorite um I would say so my some of my all-time favorites Jacqueline Carey's books I love them forever. So I'm really looking forward to um, <laughs> the Midnight Sun installment that we're getting, which I didn't see coming. I didn't think that was going to happen. So those are mainstays. I also really like urban fantasy. Jim Butcher's books have been a favorite for a long time. Um, and then I love The Magicians. So love uh, Grossman's books back in the day. I thought that those were fantastic. Those were a while back. I also just sometimes really love like literary thrillers, especially quirky, interesting ones like The Verifiers is a favorite. I think I can't remember if I read that this year or last year, but I've been telling everyone to read that one. That's so good. Um, and then um, one of my very, very good friends, Jilly Ganyu, writes these very thoughtful um, book club thrillers. And her um, the last one is out and the next one I think is coming out soon. But the last one was all dressed up and that was really fun. So I just like thoughtful kind of um, layered thrillers as well. It really is. I'm like a mood reader. Like sometimes I'll, and then I'll be like, oh, I feel like literary fiction. Everyone, very rarely compared to other stuff, but that'll happen too. So I'm kind of, I'm all across the board. Oh, wow. What kinds of TV do I like? I like a lot of TV too. Um, I don't have as much time for TV as I would ideally like. Um, I love Succession. Um, I am devastated preemptively that this is going to be the last season. I've gotten back into Yellow Jackets. So that's very exciting. 
Um, that one. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what else have I been? Actually, I will consult my list of shows <laughs> because this is very important. Okay. Um, recent favorites include I loved Euphoria. So we'll watch that for as long as it runs. That was just, I mean, anyone who's seen it, I feel like has that same sort of brutal, heartbreaking, beautiful addiction to it. Um, I really enjoyed, oh, What We Do in the Shadows, one of my all-time favorites. Yes. So good. (laughs) (laughs) So fantastic. It's so hard to explain to people. Like when you try to tell them, like, what is it about? And you're like, it's (laughs) vampires living together in Staten Island. (laughs) They're in a house and they have, it's just everything about it is so unhinged and I love it so much and the humor is so perfect. Um, And then what are my other reasons? I enjoy the peripheral. Even though I'm not like a big William Gibson reader, that was really well done, I thought, and really interesting. Insecure is one of my all-time favorites as well. Love Insecure. Wish there was something else like that happening right now. And then this is a sort of spotty in terms of like some episodes are much better than others, but Murderville, if anyone has seen that, it's, um, oh my gosh, uh, Will Arnett is playing this detective called Terry Seattle. And the show is just an improv show. So they have guest stars and they have to solve a mystery. And it's just an improv mystery where they don't know who the murderer is. And it's just, it's fantastic. It is incredibly funny. So highly recommended. It's like, just like a mindless, hilarious show. Really, really enjoy that too. Oh, that sounds great. I've actually yeah. never heard of that one. <laughs> And then my, oh, for, I can't forget this one. Battlestar Galactica, all-time favorite show, hands down. Yeah, yeah. I love Battlestar. Yeah. Oh, gosh, so good. Why aren't people making, like, what we don't, even um, For All Mankind, I think, was one of the same creators. And that was really good in terms of space drama. But I feel like it didn't have, like, the emotional depth and the general macro-micro situation that, like, nothing is Battlestar. And I feel like nothing will ever be, which is a bummer. But I'm glad to see that Katie Sackhoff's having her moment now. Oh, yes. Um, In the Mandalorian, yeah. (laughs) It's been a long time coming for her, I feel like. Exactly. Seriously. Deserve so much more. Like, (laughs) Mm -hmm. agree. Oh, and The Last of Us, of course. I feel like everyone is like, The Last of Us, so good. I really like it. It's not one of my favorites, but um, but I I liked it. I really enjoyed it. Mm -hmm. Um, and that was a recent one. And I even liked um the I always forget the um companion to game of thrones house of the dragon oh house of the dragon yeah we've been watching yeah (laughs) i thought it was pretty good i was surprised by how compelling i found it because i was like oh they had so many issues with i enjoyed game of thrones but many problems and i feel like they did take some of them into account with this one so yes in some ways i liked it more and it was like obviously very female driven in a way that i liked um so that i guess i have to watch that now it's yeah it's still a little rough like there are there are some scenes like I fast forwarded like a bunch of times because there are some things that I was like, I don't need to see this. I just don't <laughs> like I get it. You know, ladies have hard times. Very hard. Brutal, yes. definitely hard. Yeah. But I don't need to witness it and like hear no. it on screen. It's OK. I get it. No, that really. Yeah, that was hard for me, too. The mm-hmm. first time, like, like straight up gave me a panic attack with like. The- yeah, no, I was like, oh, uh, uh, yeah. no, just not. And I knew it was coming. And so I was prepared to be like, all right, we're going to skip this. I don't personally feel like equipped to deal with this and so I didn't but there are it's I especially like like they really switched up how they did sex in this one in a way that I thought was really much better informed and better intentioned than in Game of Thrones so for what that's worth it's important to me as a rom-com writer I think the like the level of like disappointment from the end of Game of Thrones makes it so hard to like enjoy any new Game of Thrones things so like that's why (laughs) I just haven't I can't like I feel like I can't let myself get hurt again like that (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I think the stakes are lower in a way with this one because it's like you kind of know because it's a, such a, a prequel so many centuries ago mm-hmm. so it's like you sort of already know what happened or you can very readily so it's not the same um yeah I, I thought I would have more of a problem with that than I do mm-hmm. yeah I I like it a lot and and uh as our you know our Ani's member has said like Patty Considine's performance is just like uh amazing like he, he it really is uh, she just like it's it's one of my favorite I think TV performances mm-hmm. ever maybe like he was just so so good yeah gosh a lot of good TV yeah <laughs> yeah there has been a lot of good TV truly and I really like I really liked um and Yellow Jackets for how brutal it is like that is an unflinching show like they don't pull any punches it's really like especially with this last season like sometimes it's really very hard to watch but it's also so surreal 
and so like hypnotically beautiful it I don't know I, I I love it I can't think of anything else like that somebody was making a joke I don't know I saw a meme and they were like you know soccer is not a gendered sport except for when it comes to Ted Lasso and Yellow Jackets because what <laughs> happens in Ted Lasso when soccer happens boys cry what happens when girls play soccer murder yeah <laughs> That's so true. Yeah, very, two very different depictions of soccer team. Yeah. <laughs> I saw someone compare those two shows to being like Tad Lasso is like what happens when boys play soccer, and Yellow Jackets is what happens when girls play yes, soccer. And exactly. One of these is way more intense than the other. <laughs> oh man. Um. Yeah. Do we have any more questions from the audience? Put yeah. Patty Constantine as the last one. Really funny, <laughs> uh, but. Um, what books have you like? Actually, if you don't mind me asking, the both of you, so I know a little bit about what Kay's been reading. What have you been reading that you've loved, Jen? Oh gosh, so I have been reading so so much for uh podcasts and stuff. I just finished. Um, I was talking to Jessica about it. So I'm a big horror reader. I um, love horror too. We've read Mister Magic by Kirsten White. Uh, I think it's coming out later this year. Um absolutely amazing it's like about a sorta um the a bunch of kids who are now adults who in their young years like starred on a kid's show but like it's sort of apocryphal and like no but not everybody remembers it and it was like there's no recordings exist of it and it's like none of the kids really remember what it was like and it's this big like weird thing like it's it's um and like then they're trying to do like a reunion of it later on and trying to like come to grips with what happened to them and figuring out like what exactly it was that happened and it's hard to explain without like you know giving stuff away so yeah (laughs) called Mr. Magic yes yeah okay Mm -hmm. I'm just gonna just write things down yeah because I need these yeah I remember you with the arc of that recently yeah the second you said Mr. Magic I was like oh yeah 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 good picture (laughs) the cover for Uh, a quarter Oh, sorry. No, 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 no. Go ahead. Oh, I was just gonna ask Jen if she, uh, if, uh, if you've read um, uh, Hidden Pictures by Jason. It's Jason Reculak, I think. I never know if I'm pronouncing the last name correctly, but it's 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 really really well done, and it's interesting, and the format is very interesting. Oh, Veronica likes it too. Yeah, it's fantastic. <laughs> it, and I was very surprised. It's one of the one of my friends recommended it, and she was like, "It's one of the few books that's ever given me a jump scare while reading a book." And wow. it does do that, which is really, really like a an achieve. I've never had that happen. And I was waiting for it and it still got me. <laughs> so like, yeah. That's super impressive. That alone like makes me yeah. really want to read it because yeah, it's wonderful. Get on the page. That's great. <laughs> the scariest book I've ever read is House of Leaves by Mark Danielewski. And I recommend it a lot. Um, it it's not so much like scary as much as it is dreading like there's so much dread that and like it took me a year to read it because I had to put it down at some point I was like I can't touch that right now and Mm -hmm. like it's it's basically if if you've never read it or heard of it it's basically about a house that may or may not exist and there was a movie that was made a documentary that Mm -hmm. was made about this movie but there's a character who's writing a thesis about the movie that may or may not exist and there's another character who found the thesis who can't find the movie so there's like layers and the every single person at each layer is like losing their mind actively as the story goes on i have such a hard time with these things um (laughs) i don't know why i have like a personal fear um of losing my mind i don't know why exactly like i've I've never lost it yet but it's (laughs) like i feel like it could happen very easily same thing as when i read books about demons i'm just very credulous and I, i just believe in everything and so I love scary books. And then I get incredibly terrified that this could happen to me. And I fully believe it. Like yeah. I have entire suspension of disbelief. So yeah, that would work really well for me. There's, or like terribly. There's parts in this book where you literally have to rotate it because the wording starts to spiral because the characters. Mm-hmm. Sp- and I think it was after like the first one I did of that, that I was like, okay, I got to stop now. <laughs> I, <laughs> I took a break. I took a break. On the subway, actually, like it was probably like 2008 or 2009. And I was like reading it on my commute at the time. And I was holding the book like this and then it's just a big like, it like this and then like <laughs> flip forward because there's also like a an extremely comp- uh, complicated like footnote apparatus, yes. you know, where they ask you to flip yeah. and forth and stuff. Yes. And so like people were looking at me weird, like what, like, and, and the person next to me is like, what are you reading? And I'm like, I'm like, I'm just know. impossibly cool. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's a crazy book, but if you want to be like disturbed, mm-hmm. that's the one I, I do want to be disturbed. I, I recommend it. And I'm- 
I've never, I know that one's it's supposed to be like a horror classic and somehow I never, I sometimes I have trouble with sort of the experimental format books. Um, but I think that one, that one does probably exactly what I wanted to do. So I should really, I should really just bite the bullet on that one. No. In terms of rom-coms, uh, Jen and I recently interviewed Olivia Dade, who wrote Spoiler Alert a few years ago. I'm obsessed. After we interviewed her, I had already finished Shipwrecked, which is her newest. Excellent. Highly recommend it. Um, and then I did a deep dive and I've read almost all of her books. I'm on the last one now. <laughs> That's why I've read like 20 books this year. Um, so she did a really great five-part series about librarians. Mm -hmm. So immediately I was like, yeah, I got to read all of those. Uh, and then her other trilogy, which I'm finishing up now, is about teachers. Uh, the first book is about like a history teacher and another, they hire another guy to like kind of replace her and like they're messing with her job. But then like they fall in love. It was cute. Uh, the second book was excellent. It's called 40 Love. And it's about this woman goes on vacation and she meets this hot tennis instructor uh, mm -hmm. while she's in the water at the beach one day and her top comes off on accident and she <laughs> flags him down for help and then they end up dating. But the draw for it, the draw of it for me was that she's 40 and he's 26. And I was kind of like, I didn't know oh. I liked this. <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay. I was kind of like, hmm, this is great. And, and it was really, she, the thing I like about Olivia Dade and then mm -hmm. I will stop gushing about her. But the thing I like about her books is they're funny. Like, like mm -hmm. yes, your books are also funny. But, like, something about her is very, like, funny and joyful and rom com -y and mm -hmm. all of that. So I, I really like her humor. Like That's and, awesome. I love funny her, books. Oh it's God! Really hard to be consistently funny. Like you yeah. don't, you don't definitely don't have to preface like, "Oh, don't worry, you're funny too." Like, <laughs> <laughs> it's not it's not necessary. Like, I promise it's okay. I I find like humor really, really effective humor. This is why I love T.J. Alexander's book so much. Like, the banter is hilarious. Like, it is just hysterically funny. That's it. Yeah. That's like it's such a thing. It's so pervasive throughout the book. Um, actually, that Jilly Ganyu has a rom com coming up. I don't know. I think she's announced it. Um, I don't even know if it has a title yet, but it's that same kind of funny where the banter is just flawless. So like, again, obviously I'm just always pushing Jilly's books because I think everything she writes is phenomenal, but I, I'm with you. Like having that be such a strong element, it's just, it's irresistible yeah, when it's it done right. Yeah, it so fun. And I mm -hmm. also just started um, Well Met by Jen DeLuca. Oh yeah. Because I also yeah, like- Another I, Berkeley author. Yep. Yeah. I actually have never read anything by her before. This is my first. Mm -hmm. And somebody was like, you like Renaissance fairs. Why haven't you read this book? I was like, you're right. Fair question. Yeah. Super fair. <laughs> and I didn't think I liked first person point of view until mm -hmm. I started reading this book. And now, now it's another one of those, like, I guess yeah. I like this. Yeah. But I think the setting really helps. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the main character, Emma- uh, I think her situation that like she's unemployed and she just had like mm -hmm. a big breakup. I like all of that too. So awesome. I'm doing that one so far. Mm. I'm getting lots of good reading recommendations. Something wild and wonderful. Yeah, that one is I've gotten that rec. It's on my list. Um that's Anita Kelly, right? I think. I think um, so. And I, I need to get on that one because I've heard yes, I've heard it recommended so many times and I don't know why I'm still sleeping on it. Like I think it's I've just been doing random mysteries and I got into like a Sarah J Maas spiral because I'd never read oh. her books somehow. And now I'm like, well, I guess I have to read all of them. <laughs> so <laughs> that's going to take me a minute. <laughs> yep. Yep. Yeah. Oh. When I finish that, that'll be the next one. Great. Oh, man. Well, do we have any more questions? Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh. Yeah. I haven't touched those. <laughs> I don't think I have the strength. <laughs> oh, they're like, I no mean, they, she, I will say she goes real heavy on like the torture backstories. It's like yeah. really hard. It's like my whole family died and then I was tortured under a mountain for 300 years. Can you heal God. me with your, can you heal me with your 11 sex? <laughs> yeah. Wow, that's magic. <laughs> I'm like, man, if someone tortured me under a mountain for 300 years, I don't know how sexy I'd feel on the other side of things. Uh. That's why I'm not an angel or a fairy, so... <laughs> comes the yeah. breaks yeah i uh i haven't read any of those either but actually now knowing that about it i'm at least morbidly curious what's going on and it's it. like uh, one of the things the and i love this i know it's not everyone's cup of tea everyone is so hot everyone everyone every <laughs> single character impossibly hot it's like 
you thought this person was hot wow like <laughs> hold on to your hat because this next one so hot like and the description it's just amazing everyone's got like popping abs and like the best hair and they're veiled in sexy shadows their <laughs> wings are sexy you can stroke their wings. it's just oh, it's so God. it's so it's like wonderful i really enjoy it because i'm like mm -hmm, totally hot people everywhere it's like a cw book sort of oh my god it. okay that makes totally. perfect sense I, yeah. that's kind of what i was imagining you know while you were talking i was like cw cheekbones and yes like everyone's got there everyone's cheekbones cast shadows yeah. you can like tell what time of day it is by someone's <laughs> It's <laughs> fantasy <laughs> Riverdale is what it is. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oh boy. Oh, that's rules. Oh, this has been a lot of fun. Thank you so much for joining us. Ooh, thank you great. so much. This was wonderful. Um want to uh give uh your book title to I mean to our audience again, just so we are all sure yeah, of it. Of course. Back in a spell. Yes. Book number it. three in the Witches of Thistle Grove. Book number four in Charm's Way is coming in August. So pretty soon, since time has no meaning. I'm like, that could be any time. <laughs> Eventually. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Something to look forward to. Well, thank you again. Yeah. This has been really lovely and it was so great to talk to you. Thank you so much. All right. Well, have a good night, everybody. Uh, this has been Jen with my fabulous co-host. I'm Kay. And uh, yeah, good night. We'll see y'all soon. Take care. Bye -bye.